Should Christians keep the Ten Commandments? To answer, we'll consider how there was a shift away from the law of Moses during the ministry of Christ. We'll talk about the work of Christ on the cross. And finally, how love is the fulfillment of the law. Before we dive into this study, please take a moment to subscribe to my channel. If you want to be alerted when new content is posted, please tap the bell icon. And if you find this video useful, please give me a thumbs up and post a comment. Help those faceless algorithms of YouTube find my channel. So should Christians keep the Ten Commandments? The Gospel accounts emphasize a shift away from the law of Moses. John the Baptist urged the multitudes who came to hear him, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Luke chapter 3 verses 8 and 9 held their descent from Abraham to be a sacred heritage, so much so that they trusted the merits of Abraham's life would be sufficient to save his children. John disabused them of such notions, urging them to repent and to show the results of repentance in their life. Should they fail to do so, judgment awaited. God was prepared to hold the biological children of Abraham accountable for their resistance to his will. John laid the groundwork for Jesus, blazing a trail away from the law and prophets and the traditions developed by man. Jesus then picks up where John left off. He says in the Sermon on the Mount, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. When one reads through the Sermon on the Mount, one is left with the inescapable sense that Jesus is breaking into uncharted territory. Thirteen times in these first two chapters of the Beloved Discourse, Jesus contrasts the law and the traditions held dear by his fellow Jews with his own perspective. But I say, for I say, assuredly I say, for this reason, Jesus felt the need to offer a disclaimer. It may sound like I'm destroying the law and the prophets, but be assured, my teaching, in fact, fulfills them. Therefore, he concludes in Matthew 7, 12, Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. To love one's neighbor as oneself fulfills the law. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So without question, one cannot read the Sermon on the Mount without noticing Jesus shifting his disciples toward something beyond the law. His conversation with the woman at the well in John 4 predicts another shift away from what the Jews had known. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. John chapter 4, verses 21 and 23. The Samaritans held Mount Gerizim to be holy, while the Jews believed the Temple Mount in Jerusalem was where God dwelt and therefore could be worshipped. However, Jesus told the Samaritan woman that a day approaches when physical location would be irrelevant for worship, even though the law and prophets clearly taught Jerusalem was where God had placed His name. God was reorienting his expectations for worship. One day he would no longer be concerned with mountains and temples, but would seek people who wanted to worship him in spirit and truth. So the gospel accounts emphasize a shift away from the law and the traditions which developed out of the law. Descent from Abraham was less important than repentance. Loving one's neighbor as oneself fulfills the law. God was seeking a different type of worship. This shift culminates in the work of Christ on the cross. The crucifixion of Jesus accomplished many things. It was a one-time offering which paid for the sins of all human beings across all human history. The cross was the ultimate demonstration of God's love for his creation. God gave the very best of himself in order to redeem those who were unworthy. 
The crucifixion of Jesus was a gift, a propitiation, which God offered to satisfy his need for justice. But for our purposes in this study, let's notice another important effect. The crucifixion of Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses in some way. Beginning in Ephesians 2.11, Paul discusses the separation between Jew and Gentile. Jews were distinct from the Gentiles for many reasons. Among them was the covenant of circumcision. By the blood he shed on the cross, Jesus unified Jews and Gentiles. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace." and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Ephesians 2, 14-16 Notice how Paul describes the effect of the law. It built a wall between Jews and Gentiles, and the commandments made the two groups enemies. The death of Jesus removed what separated Jew from Gentile. Jesus broke down the middle wall of separation. He abolished the law of commandments. He put to death the enmity. It's difficult to read this passage and not reach the conclusion that the law is no longer relevant for the one who follows Christ. Colossians, the book written at the same time as Ephesians, offers this. Jesus wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Chapter 2, verse 14. Paul expresses the same idea from Ephesians. The law worked against humanity and was therefore removed by the crucifixion of Jesus. The apostle goes on to say, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. The law with its dietary restrictions, its liturgical calendar, and all of the other elements it contained foreshadows the spiritual reality we have in Christ. To insist we must keep the law means we insist on following the shadow rather than the one who casts the shadow, Jesus Christ. So with the death of Jesus, the law of Moses also passed away in a sense. Which brings me to my final point. Love fulfills the law. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, and later he told us, Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7, 12. When I love my neighbor as myself, I am, in a sense, fulfilling the law. Specifically, I am fulfilling the moral code articulated by the law. Later in his ministry, Jesus explains it this way, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, 37-40 Loving God first and loving one's neighbor as oneself remain intact after the cross, These two commandments guide our morality. Here's how Paul explains it in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. As I said earlier, the Ten Commandments articulate a morality that is summed up by the two greatest commands. Paul mentions several of those commands that guide how we treat one another. If I seek to do good to my neighbor, I am fulfilling some of the Ten Commandments. And if I love God above all others, I fulfill some of the rest. So should Christians keep the Ten Commandments? Well, remember, the ministry of Jesus represented a shift away from the law. John challenged his audience to repent and to not trust in their descent from Abraham. 
Jesus taught that love fulfilled the law. He indicated that worship itself would shift away from mountains and temples toward a more spiritual approach. So the ministry of Jesus represents a shift. And at the cross, many things changed. And among those changes was the removal of the law. Jesus nailed the elements of the law which separated Jew from Gentile. He nailed them to the cross. Paul describes some elements as a shadow of what was to come in Christ. So yes, some of the law did pass away. However, the morality of the law was retained. Jesus taught us to love God and to love our neighbor, the two greatest commandments. Paul echoes Jesus when he instructs us to love our neighbor as ourselves and thereby fulfill the law. So should we keep the Ten Commandments? Well, if they involve loving God and loving our neighbor, then the answer is yes. However, there is one which remains. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I know some of my friends believe we should honor this commandment but I take a different view. Paul says, Let no one judge you in Sabbaths, for they are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. The Sabbath is a shadow of things to come. It appears to me that the Sabbath day has passed away as a commandment to be kept. I plan to share my point of view in future studies if God is willing. So should we keep the Ten Commandments? So long as it means loving God first and loving our neighbor as ourself, the answer is yes.